What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mike Zuniga Films Podcast. On this episode, I have with me Carlton Dennis. He is a tax reduction strategist and a Forbes Business Development member. Carlton shares how trusting his instincts led to better career choices after college, how he effectively manages his time to stay productive during the day, and he also gives advice on how small businesses and freelancers, especially those in the creative space, can save on taxes. So without further ado, Carlton Dennis. This podcast is brought to you by Suave Apparel, which I'm actually wearing right now. If you like listening to music while working out, you probably use an armband to hold your smartphone. I have to admit, I used to wear one, but we both know it eventually gets loose, slides down your arm, and annoys you. But what if I told you there is a better way to hold your smartphone while you work out? Introducing Suave, compression shorts with a side pocket for your smartphone. Now, I've been wearing Suaves for almost two years now, and they are game changers. Designed and made in Los Angeles, California, these are the most comfortable pairs of underwear I've ever worn, hands down. My phone stays secure through any workout without obstructing my movement, and I also wear my Suaves when I'm out on set filming, especially for long days. They stay comfortable, and not to mention, their moisture-wicking technology helps me stay dry as well. So, if you like listening to music on your smartphone while working out, go to www.suaveapparel.com and use promo code Mike for 15% off your next order. That is www.suaveapparel.com and use promo code Mike, M-I-K-E, for 15% off your next order. The link will be down below in the show notes so you can go check them out. Your workouts will never be the same. So Carl, how's it going? Doing well, man. Thank you for having me. Of course, dude. I want to have you on just because... You know, you've personally helped me with my taxes, and I know you're all about taxes. You've been doing taxes for a while. That's your thing. And uh, I know that you have a lot of great things to say and uh, yeah. give to my audience that you have, and your audience as well. Yeah. So the first thing I want to talk about is fitness, because I've known you since high school. You've yeah. always been into fitness, and you're still into fitness up to this day. So what got you into fitness, and how do you keep going with fitness as part of your life yeah so i believe that fitness helped me um turn into the athlete that i was in college when i was in high school i had a huge turning point um where i was one of the guys who was kind of undersized um viewed as the backup player Mm -hmm. the guy who never got to touch the field fitness helped me become a name in the football world um, right around my junior year in high school is when I started taking the weight room extremely serious. Um, I just remember me and coach Thomas, my head football coach in high school started working out together for the first time and, um, just seeing his work ethic, it all just fell into me and I wanted to utilize him to grow what I could possibly do in the football and fitness world. And so what coach Thomas was able to do for me, um, was he gave me a super motivated passion and I was actually able to become a really good athlete in college based off the work ethic he instilled in me in high school. So it all started for me in high school and it's still going on for me right now. Fitness is something that I don't think I'll ever put aside. Um, and it's always been my number one passion. Yeah, I mean, shout out Coach Thomas. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, he's an he, intense guy. He is, but he he definitely uh, helped provide a great foundation for for us. Yeah. All those that went through his program. So, props to him. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's one of those things that you don't really realize, I guess. Like you know, going to high school, going through um, a program like football that we went through, or any other program, and um, even like a high school that we went to. Um, and then later on in life, it affects you, yeah. you know? So, you know, it's, it's good to, it's good to realize what you went through and know that it played a big role in your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And where it played the biggest role was my senior year. Um, because my senior year, we had already had won a state championship my junior year. Mm -hmm. And this was the year where I was striving to get his football scholarship. Yeah. So all of the work that I put in, in the off season with coach Thomas, my junior year helped me to get the scholarships from the various different universities that I got to go to or got that I got scholarships from. Mm -hmm. Then I had the opportunity to go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, where I was surrounded by other football athletes who had worked super hard to get to where they were too. Mm -hmm. Um, And this really tested um, my fitness and my character. At Cal Poly, 
I was surrounded by a lot of other people who had strived really hard in high mm -hmm. school to get on the fitness level that I was at. And now I felt like I was, um, I was surrounded by people who were all the same like me. There was no standing out anymore. Back in high school, I could stand out um, by being the strongest person. I just remember working so hard my junior year to become the strongest defensive back I could possibly be. And then when I got to college, I was surrounded by all people who were just as strong as me. Yeah. So then I had to look inside and figure out, okay, I can't just rely on just strength. I need to become a better cornerback. I need to actually get on the field and um, develop my skills as a corner. Mm -hmm. And college was a big wake up call. When I was a freshman, I was one of the biggest freshmen. Although we were all around the same strength, I had all this muscle and I couldn't really move on the field. Uh -huh. And so what I had to do was really humble myself, spend more of the time with the seniors and the upperclassmen on getting my footwork down so I can be, be successful in the position that I had gotten a scholarship from. Mm. So that was how fitness kind of transitioned for me. It started off being something that I just wanted to be very passionate about in high school so I can get to, to being on the field mm. and that I can play. Then I earned myself a scholarship and then I went on to college got washed because I was surrounded by so many people that were all like-minded and had the same work ethic as me my freshman year. I adopted a new mentality, humbled myself, learned the footwork skills so that way I can be the athlete that I was in college. And the passion that developed in high school never left me. My work ethic, my drive, it, it helps me in what I'm doing today in the tax world. And it also helped me even outside of football when I decided to continue on keeping my body in shape and even helping other people in the fitness world. Yeah. Right. I like what you said. Um, just because I think that still applies to any part of life. The fact that you realized what weaknesses that you had at that point and what you needed to work on to make you a better athlete. And that applies in the business world as well. Like you, I'm sure for you as well, you go and you invest in yourself in different courses. Like for example, Grant Cardone is a course that you do. Right. Um, and that kind of helps enhance your sales skills. That, I mean, that's something that I'm going to be talking about later on, but I like that you touched upon that because I think that's very important as well. And especially for the fitness side, I think fitness is very important as uh, you know, person in business or entrepreneur, whoever else, whatever profession, because I mean, wouldn't you say like, you know, keeping fitness is a very important part of your life without a doubt, because what I like to do, and this is something personal to me is I like to get up and work out right at the beginning of the morning, right around 4:30 AM. Um, and the reason why I still do it to this day is because that was instilled in me back in high school. We used to get up and do the hardest thing we possibly could do, which was push our body to its limits right at the beginning of the day. When you're doing the hardest thing you could possibly do at the beginning of the day, everything else that falls after that throughout the day becomes easier, mm -hmm. such as going to class and getting schoolwork done. Schoolwork to me is a lot easier than grinding and pushing your muscles to the fullest extent that they could possibly be pushed to in the weight room. Mm -hmm. um, even handling clients and doing some of the things that I'm doing now, it still doesn't compare to the amount of pain I put my body through at 4.30 in the morning before people are even awake. Mm -hmm. So the discipline to wake up at that time and putting my body through something so difficult, it makes a lot of the other things in my life a lot easier and easier to cope with. And so um, definitely being an athlete instills some deeper traits in you that carry on into the business world and into really all aspects of your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's very important. When So when you went to college, yeah. what did you major in? Yeah. So when I went to college, I decided to major in kinesiology. I wanted to continue on the path that I had started in high school, which was diving into my body, making sure that I can become the best possible athlete that I could. And the only thing that I knew was working out. Well, kinesiology is the study of how the body moves. I figured at that time, being 17 and a half, mm -hmm. that going into a major learning about the body would help me perform mm -hmm. on the field better, as well as help people outside if I decided to pursue a career outside of football. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give myself um, the environment of fitness. And kinesiology, it's all about fitness, exercise, and how certain mu muscles innervate. Um, so I learned a lot that helped me on the field but there was a lot of information that I wasn't expecting to learn when yeah. I went to college. So um, it was a really good wake up call for me being at Cal Poly and learning that kinesiology isn't just about the weights and learning about the muscles. It's really about yeah. learning about how the whole body works as a system. 
Got it. Yeah. So did you, that was your main major. Did you ever do like a minor in business or anything? I minored in nutrition. Yeah. Really? And I, okay. I, I didn't think I was going to, um, but when I was in my junior year, um, I started seeing the business side of things. I started seeing how fitness influencers were becoming popular on social media, how it's easy to start a business online and get people to follow you and create them programs. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually need to be there training them, but you can create a workout program that they can follow and you could just coach them online. And so I went around the NCAA and started Mm -hmm. a business and um, I started providing workout programs. And then a lot of the people who I was providing workout programs wanted to have nutrition programs too. I didn't know too much about nutrition. Mm-hmm. And when you're a kinesiology major, you only made, you only have to take nutrition one time. Uh-huh. And so my knowledge level in the nutrition field wasn't that great. Oh, okay. So I minored in nutrition just to give myself a little bit more understanding and a little bit more insight on how I can help the people who want my workout programs by providing them the diet side too. Because uh-huh. you heard diet is like 70% of it. Fitness is really 30% of how you become really in shape and get the body that you want. And I believe that too. Mm-hmm. Um, nutrition is the deciding factor on whether or not you're going to have the body that you really want. doesn't matter how hard you work in the gym. Right. You have to match it with uh, nutrition. And so taking that minor in nutrition taught me a lot. I wasn't super passionate about nutrition. I just did it to do it. Um, but it gave me insight to help grow my business at that time. Got yeah. it. So so would you? what would you say is like the positive and negative about college? Positive about college is meeting people. That is the number one problem positive about college networking. I have over 30 clients that I've onboarded just this year that are college grads. It's amazing. I get to not only get to help them with what I, my new skill, which is taxation and Mm -hmm. helping them save money with their taxes. Um, it's a way for me to, to learn about more what they're doing in the field and how their skills can help me. Mm -hmm. I have tons of clients that work in various different businesses, insurance, car salesmen, brokers, real estate agents. These are people that you're gonna need in your life at one point in in another. Mm -hmm. College allows you to have a connection with someone who can provide value to you rather than you going to a stranger and having to put your trust in them. And I think that's a huge thing that college did. It surrounded me with the right people, gave me the connections that I needed, and it taught me little intricate skills on how to to hold myself up on my own. I went to college at Cal Poly, so I was away from home. So I learned how to live on my own. I learned how to manage my money, manage rent, manage expenses. That taught me a little bit more about the stuff I was gonna be doing once I got outside of college and got a job. Um, So that's the type of things that I believe college really provided to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, I I didn't get the knowledge that I was really looking for that's helping me today from college. Like I said, I majored in kinesiology, I'm filing tax returns now and doing tax (laughs) planning for real estate investors and business owners, completely different than kinesiology. And you can't tell me I I don't love what I do because I'm so passionate about this. Mm -hmm. But if you would have met me back when I was 21, you would have thought, oh, this guy's gonna become the next fitness star. And it's just funny how things can shift for you, how you can have your mindset on going in one direction when you go into college and come out and be doing something completely different. Right, and I think that happens a lot for a lot of college students. Yeah, Like you go in doing one thing, you think you, that's gonna be like your sole profession career, and then you're doing a whole different thing. Right. You know, but you never know. Yeah. But I, like you said, I think, you know, college, a good thing about college is definitely meeting people. Of course. For sure. 100%. It's the connections you make. Yeah. Um, when I, and if you don't mind, Mike. Go ahead. When I got outside of college, I wanted to pursue what I had majored in. That was my innate thing. It was like, okay, I majored in this. I have to go get a career in this. Mm-hmm. When you major in kinesiology, it's a very, uh, it's a very intricate, it's a very intricate degree to have. There's only certain, so many things you can do with kinesiology degree. You can become mm-hmm. a doctor, which means you're going to doctorate school. <laughs> you can become a physical therapist, uh-huh. which means you're going to physical therapy school. Yeah. You can become a chiropractor, which means you're going to chiropractic school. Uh-huh. Or even become a personal trainer. And there's, of course, there's a few other things that you can become. Mm -hmm. But personal training was the route that didn't have much school left. So, um, and I knew that that was something that I had a niche in. Now, when I decided to become a personal trainer outside of college, I was on the ground level. I had to figure out how to run a business, how to set up a website, how to do all these different things that my kinesiology degree did not give me. So that's something that I had to go out and seek information, YouTube look on courses. How can I grow a business? Because college didn't tell me how to grow a business. Mm -hmm. It just taught me how to learn that one thing. Got it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So after you graduated, 
because you I know you said you were trying to pursue a little bit the kinesiology path Mm -hmm. but what shifted like how did you start following taxes yeah so when i left out of my first employer which was gala wine company loved working there it's a great job to have when you're coming out of college getting into some good income and kind of running your own um, business within the company because they really give you your own space inside of that company um, I left out a Gala Wine Company and came into my mom's job, um, which is at Carla Denison Associates. She runs a full tax and accounting firm. Part of the reason why I switched from Gala Wine Company to my mother's business um, is because something did click in my in me. Um, I realized I was working for a family-owned company that I liked. I really liked the family-owned company, but I love my own family. And my mom had her own family-owned company that she had been running for 28 years without a sales team. One thing that Gallo gave me is it gave me sales skills. Gallo had incredible structure. So I learned all these different sales skills while I was working for them, selling wine to um, various different companies such as Rouse, Stater Brothers, you name it. When I decided to join my mom's company, she did not have a sales team. Her business came in from word of mouth, events, um, TV shows, and um, being on the news channel. So my mom had a lot of popularity in Orange County and in California um, just from her name. But she didn't have a team that was dedicated to calling on the leads that she had that can bring in the new dollars um, and really drive income. So what I decided to do is I decided to take my sales knowledge from Gallo and bring it into my mom's company. Mm -hmm. And I created her first business development department three years ago. From there, I decided to get my tax license and hire some sales reps beneath me once I got my knowledge level up. I put together a bunch of systems and processes and procedures so that way we can work and perform to our fullest capabilities. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, we've been rocking since. Got it. Yeah. So I know I was, at that point, I was talking to you when you were about to transition from Gallo. Yeah. Can you tell me what happened at (sighs) Gallo, like right before you left? Yeah. Do you remember that that, that, uh, drive we had when I was telling you, I was like, I don't know if this is... This is something I can see myself doing long term. I have this innate thing in me that this passion inside of me that's telling me I need to go do something else. I feel like I'm meant for more. Were you about to be promoted? I was about to be promoted. Uh, (laughs) So funny. (laughs) So I, I was really good at selling for Gallo. Like I, I was on a really ambitious team. Gallo separates you into little sales teams and they place you into different cities. So we were in downtown LA and when I was working for Gallo, I became really good at selling to my distributors by developing relationships and just getting on the right level. When it became time to make that decision for myself internally that I wanted to shift from Gallo and move towards my mom's office and approach new opportunities, um, it was right around the time that the Gallo was letting me know they're getting ready to promote me. And I didn't know this, but the day that I went into the office to give them my two weeks Mm -hmm. was the day that they promoted me. So I had my two week letter (laughs) in my back pocket, literally in my back pocket. Uh And I'm sitting down with the head of Gallo, um, not the CEO, but the head of the Southern Section Department. He's telling me, Carlton, you know, here are the reasons why I think you're a great salesperson for our company. This is where I see you going. By the way, I would like to offer you this new position. Uh What do you think? I was like, oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know what to say. I need to be very honest with you. The reason I am even in the office today is because I wanted to talk to you about something different. (laughs) Then I reached to my back pocket and I was sat this down. He's like, what's that? This is my, t- my two week letter. I am actually moving in a different direction and I am so sorry that it had to be today. I appreciate what you're doing for me, but unfortunately my life is going in a different direction and I need to pursue something. And I had this burning, burning ember inside of me that told me I had to go do this other thing. And I was so scared. I was so nervous, I cried. I was literally like, oh my gosh, like I love this company, I love the people, I'm surrounded by 21 and 22, 23, 24 year olds, all people my age, we Mm -hmm. all get to go out to happy hours, have a great time, come into work, sell wine. You can't beat a job like that. But there was something inside of me that I told me, Carlton, you have to go do something else. This is is what you need to do. You need to go build something around you. Mm -hmm. You need to go, you need to go right now. And I made that choice and I didn't look back and I've never regretted that decision. 
The only other thing I regret is that I didn't do it sooner. And when I made that decision to switch over into my mom's office, it was right around the time that I was also believing in myself that I could really run my own business for the first time. I partly wanted to use my mom's office to have more time to develop my own business. Mm -hmm. So I had a crutch. I used my mom's office as a crutch. Mm -hmm. And when I first stepped into her office, Mike, I was spending most of my time setting up stuff for my business. Very little time actually doing stuff for Carla Dennison Associates. Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone has the opportunity to do something like that where their mother has their own business that you can step into and play hooky and work on your own business while you're in there. Mm -hmm. Nor is that right to do, but I did choose to do that. As I was growing my fitness name, I started seeing the opportunity that I was leaving on the table by not pursuing the sales that were coming in through the door. I also realized the price differences in the sales that were coming in through the door. Mm -hmm. I was selling workout programs for $99 and here we are selling tax returns and tax planning at Mm $9,000. So there was a big difference. Then I had another change that happened to me personally. I had a conversation with myself Mm -hmm. and I asked myself, Carlton, what is it that you really want in your life? Because Carlton, you can, you can go down this fitness route. You're a successful person. You're ambitious. Anything you put your mind to, Carlton, you know you're going to accomplish. But what is it when, you, when everything is said and done, what is it that you really want in life? And the answer, Mike, to that question, and it took me a long time to find <laughs> that answer, man. And I, and I hope that everyone finds this answer for themselves, what they really want in life, because it shifts your focus. I want control. And I had to be okay with that. I want financial security. I had to ask myself, Carlton, what is it that you really want? I had to zoom forward 20, 30 years and look into the future and turn back around and say, okay, now I know what I need to do to get there. I need to have a vehicle that provides me with the income so that I can have the control to do whatever I want when I want, and that comes with financial security. And so working in my mom's tax firm and shifting my focus over into the sales side, I started seeing the money come in, but I wasn't passionate yet. So then I became money hungry and that's dangerous to become. Mm -hmm. You never want to become money hungry. So I started seeing the money come in. I started liking that. But then another little thing happened. I started spending more of my time hanging around my mom and understanding how she communicated with clients. I didn't like getting on the phone and just running my same sales pitch and just hoping that the client was going to be able to sign the deal. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to provide them information i wanted to know the knowledge not just sell it Mm -hmm. i wanted to actually know it yeah that's when that second shift happened i studied for my tax license i said you know what i'm gonna become a licensed accountant Mm -hmm. i could sell anything Mm -hmm. but i want to be knowledgeable about what i'm selling because being good at sales can only get you so far when you're in love with your product and you know how it works and you know the ins and outs of your industry then you become lethal And that's what Mm -hmm. I wanted to become. That's when the transition happened. When I put all my chips into the tax back Mm -hmm. uh, bucket, got my license, it renewed my ambition. And the next thing you know, I'm enjoying being on the phone with clients. Mm -hmm. It almost became a game to me because I knew I could sell them. But now that I know the information, it is so nice being able to provide clients with peace of mind by giving them answers. And that's what I love most now about taxes, providing answers to people that they didn't have before. Right. And one thing I like about that is because a lot of people are afraid to take the leap part Mm -hmm. of, you know, doing what they want to do. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, starting your own business or, you know, being an entrepreneur or whatever else. It doesn't have to be specifically in business. It can be for a different, you know, company. You you know, you want to be doing a different position in the company or whatever else. But the fact that, you know, taking the leap is the hardest part, Yeah. you know, trying to trust in yourself and the fact that you have a burning desire to do one other thing. But, you know, I mean, kudos to you, man, because like you, you definitely took that leap. And I know for sh- for you, it was tough, especially the fact that <laughs> you were, pr- you were handed over a promotion, a promotion on the day that I, of you were, you were going to leave. And there's not too many people that will tell you that, Mike, that yeah. they turned down a promotion at a great company that they were in love with yeah. to go pursue their own dreams. Right. You, <laughs> it, 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 you won't hear very many people say that. 
Yeah. I loved working at Gallo. The people I loved working with, mm -hmm. the environment was so, I would wake up and be like, I'm going to work today. Yeah. I used to love it, but yeah. there was still this other thing in my head that was talking to me, Carlton, you know this isn't you long term. Mm. Carlton, you know you're meant for more. So I can either choose to hit the cruise control button and just be in that block off the other Carlton mode and just cruise because I'm doing well for myself and I have a nice little comfy job and I hashtag made it, right? You get, a, you get out of college, you get mm -hmm. yourself a nice paying job, you made it, right? Or I could take a leap of faith since I'm so young and go pursue something and go see because I don't, I don't care if I trip and fall, at least I decided to run the race. Maybe I started the race with my shoes tied. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Maybe I needed to go back to the start line, untie my shoes, and make sure that they're tied individually. But at least I got to the start line. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that never even get to the start line to run the race that they're meant to be on for the rest of their life. There's people that just sit in the blocks and they're like, you know what? I was never meant to do this race because they doubt themselves and they live in fear. I had to get over that fear and right on the other side of fear, Mike, is opportunity. Mm -hmm. And now right. that I've stepped over the other side, the opportunity window keeps increasing because I keep pushing in more of me into what I'm doing now. The more I put my soul, my heart, um, and my passion into this tax stuff and learning more about it and learning more about sales and about marketing so I can engage with my clients more, the more opportunity has opened up. And that is something I'll forever be thankful for mm -hmm. because I'm always striving for more opportunity. But when you're doing the best that you possibly can and pushing yourself to the fullest capabilities, opportunity just happens. You mm -hmm. don't have to go out looking for it. It right. just happens. Right. So while on the ta topic of taxes, um, you know, the yeah. one important thing that a lot of, I would say young entrepreneurs or even those right now that have been running a company, um, whether they're a freelancer or they have a team, you know, what's one thing or just a couple things that they don't know about taxes, but they should know? Yes. So I don't know if I've had a chance to share with people. I'm writing a book for millennials on um, I even wrote it down what millennials <laughs> do not know about taxes because I did not want to forget the name of it. Um, Millennials don't know that taxes are their number one biggest expense. In a millennial's head, they think that rent is their biggest expense. Their parents are teaching them certain things when they're younger. Go to school, get a job, save your money, invest in a 401k, buy a house. Mm -hmm. Until they get those things, they are living very frugally, but they are also thinking kind of wrong. They're thinking that their rent is their biggest expense. So they need to live somewhere um, where they're not paying so much in rent. They need to make sure that their cell phone bill is extremely low. They need to make sure that their car payment's not too high and their car insurance isn't too high. What really is your number one biggest expense that eats away at your money and you being able to save to grow towards your financial freedom mm -hmm. is your taxes. If you can mitigate the number one thing that is your biggest expense, you can get yourself to where you're going a lot faster. And that's what millennials don't know. And my goal is to break um, their understanding and their thought mm -hmm. process because I was in that same thought process when I was younger and I want them to see the other side and learn more about the taxes so that way they can get to themselves to where they want to go financially a lot faster. Right, right. Well, another second thing, because uh, you did ask me, what are some things? Millennials look forward to refunds. They mm -hmm. look forward to refunds. They almost look at it as like a, uh, like a little piggy savings account thing that they get at the end of the year. It's like, I did so good and now I have a kick boost of savings into the next year. Mm -hmm. I don't want millennials to look at refunds as good things. And the reason why is because the IRS is not our friend. They're not. The IRS are bill collectors. They're bill collectors. That is what they do and that is what they're trained to do. Mm -hmm. When you are keeping your withholdings at zero, meaning that you're not... Um, you're, you're pretty much not having anything withheld from your paychecks, you're, or sorry, you're having everything withheld from your paychecks. Mm -hmm. um, you're pretty much giving the IRS an interest-free loan all year long. They're holding on to your money, they can do whatever they want with that money, and then they give you a refund at the end of the year. And that refund is treated as income in the following year. Mm 
Mm-hmm. That is something that I don't believe is really good because if you know time value of money, mm-hmm. you should have your money right now because it's more valuable to you right now to do other things such as investing that money, paying off your debt or putting yourself into a better financial position right now rather than waiting all the way until the end of the year to get your refund check back and then you nine times out of 10 are going to expend that on, on something for yourself rather than putting that money towards something to build your financial future for yourself. Right. And that's something that I see a lot with uh, millennials. We look forward to our refunds because we look forward to vacation. And millennials sometimes utilize their refund as their vacation money. They work so hard, I need a break, taxes come around, mm-hmm. let me use that refund for a vacation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in terms of, um, like let's say those that are running their own business but in the creative space, I know you did taxes for someone that is a full-time YouTuber. Yeah. So. How did you help them kind of save on taxes or kind of use their money efficiently? Yeah, absolutely. So the YouTuber who I met, he's a great guy. He very passionate about his business like you are. Um, And so I immediately appealed to him because I love people who are passionate and they care so much about their businesses. One thing about tax accountants is, at least tax accountants here at our office, is when we see people who have businesses, we realize that it's like your baby. You're working so hard to build something up. It's so hard being a business owner. Mm -hmm. All we want to do is make sure that we educate you, communicate with you on the same level so you can understand and make sure we're saving you the most amount of money possible. What I noticed was that when he had set up his business, he had done some research online. And online, Google, Wikipedia told him that he should set up his business as a sole proprietor. The first year he set up his business as a sole proprietor, he did really good income. He made pretty substantial income, nothing six figures wise, but he pushed up against it. Mm -hmm. He got to the end of the year and had this fat tax bill, huge tax bill that he wasn't expecting. The internet didn't tell him about that tax bill that he was gonna expect, and nor was he in communication with a tax accountant all year long to Mm -hmm. know how to mitigate that tax bill. He ended up owing the IRS, He had to get on a payment plan to pay it off, kind of like having a Netflix account. He paid every single month for it. (laughs) And the following year, he was a little scared to make more money. But you're a business owner. You have to continue to increase your revenue. So when he got to me, he was a little confused on what he should do. He went back to the internet again, and the internet told him he should actually set up an LLC. So the time he got to me, he was actually as an LLC this time. So... He went from a sole proprietor in his first year not knowing me. His second year, he set up an LLC. Then he came to me the following week after the LLC was already set up. He said, Carlton, I set up an LLC. I want to know that I have created the right vehicle to save myself some money. I said, you're almost there. He is almost there. He finally separated the liability from himself. When you set up a limited liability company, an LLC, you are separating the liability from yourself. So I was happy about that. When you're operating like a business, make sure you're working like a true business and set up a business for you, an LLC or an S corporation. One thing that I noticed that he was doing, um, or one thing I noticed that he was still subject to was self-employment tax. Self-employment tax is made of your FICA, Social Security and Medicare being the main two components that make up FICA. And it's roughly 15.3%. So if you net $100,000, Fifteen thousand three hundred dollars is going in a check to the I, the R, and the S right away, mm-hmm. and then what's left over is subject to your normal federal tax rate. So I knew he was being double taxed. What I wanted to do was just educate him about the various different things that we can do, the strategies that we can implement to help him offset his income and avoid the self-employment tax. What we ended up doing was we ended up switching his LLC to an S corporation eliminated his self-employment tax and gave him a nice payroll deduction, which ended up saving the guy over $20,000 in income. So just him having that meeting with me and me getting on the same level with him as a millennial, I was able to connect him to the answer he really had been seeking, which was working with a tax advisor and making sure he was saving his money as he grew his business. Yeah. Yeah, that's very important. You know, I kind of went through like the same thing um, before... I asked you uh, for help with it. And um, originally I started out with the LLC, same thing. First year, you know, got hit hard with taxes. Yeah. And I did not expect that. <laughs> it's a surprise and, to and everyone. And it was such a big bummer, dude. Yeah. So then after that, I consulted you and then you said, because of like the tax changes and things like that, uh, new tax laws, you know, this is a better route to go. Right. And uh, definitely, I mean, you, you saved, you helped me save money with yeah. my taxes. 
So yeah. it does work. Yeah. You know, and it's just those little things you don't know. I mean, people think like, oh man, taxes, it's not fun. It's so, uh, you know, not interesting at all, but it's not fun when, you know, you lose money to the IRS. You're absolutely you know? right. Especially There's as a business. Two things people care about most, their health and their money. And if you can have an impact on those two things, you're helping somebody. And the, it's funny that I say that health and money because I was in the health field first, helping people with their fitness. Yeah. And I switched over into the money side of things when I went into the tax world. Um, but one thing that I, I shifted um, in how I ran business was I started penetrating what's called my power base. And this is something that I learned off of Grant Cardone, who is one of the leaders in the sales field. I took his sales training course, so it taught me a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Your power base is your closest group of friends and family. And everyone has a power base of at least 30 people. Everyone has a power base of at least 30 people. If you're in the sales world or any world where you're selling products or services, you need to penetrate your power base, your closest groups of friends or family members who you know are gonna need your products or services that you offer. Everyone has to get their taxes done. If you're a qualified dependent, even you have to get your taxes done. So when I knew that, I knew I could penetrate my friends, such as you, Mike, um, such as some of the other friends who I work with, um, even Esley, who does the photography. Mm -hmm. I know that there were certain friends and family members who are gonna need my help with taxes. Turns out that I knew that you were set up as an LLC, and I had learned about the new tax law changes. Mm -hmm. I knew that by switching you to an S corporation, I could eliminate your self-employment tax and I could qualify you to get the new 20% deduction, qualified business income deduction on all the income you had made in the 2018 year. So that was some information I was able to provide to you right away. You came into the office. Um, it was a very organic conversation since we're friends and we got the, the deal handled. Um, and that's something that I have to explain to a lot of clients who don't know me, but penetrating my power base makes it a much easier conversation because you already trust me. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that, that's good. That's very important. Like start with the people that you know first. Correct. And start then work your way you know. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. So what you said was great. It was, it was gold. And now you're trying to, you know, let a lot more people know about taxes, right. uh, especially through social media. Right. And you are starting to increase your social media presence right. by providing more value in your posts. So what have you done or what helps you provide consistent content? Because people might say like, I don't have, you know, things that I can provide value to, but like, for example, Gary V said, you know, document, mm -hmm. you know, document what you're doing. And from that, pull out some tidbits or whatever clips to provide consistent stream of content. So what have you done yeah. for your personal like social media strategy? Yeah. What, what you do right now? Absolutely. So one of the number one things that I do to make sure that I'm providing value to the people who follow me on social media is I like to ask my followers, what tax questions do you guys have? What are some things that even your parents have questions about? Those are the types of questions that a lot of people have questions on but are afraid to go out and ask people about. And so if I can get to the viewer and just ask them directly, hey, send it to me in a direct message, leave me a comment, I will respond to this either on my video feed, on my live, or I'll go ahead and post a post about it. I wanna make sure I can get your questions addressed. I also document my day, so that way people can see that I'm consistent, that I'm always there. They know exactly what to expect in the morning and what to expect in the evening. So that way they can get familiar with being on my page and they're using my content to help them about their days. I know that a lot of my followers always comment on how disciplined I am. I tend to work out in the mornings and I show it. Um, I read my Bible passages in the morning and eat a nice big breakfast before I come into the office and call all these leads always that I have to that. call. <laughs> and everyone's like, Carlton, you never miss a breakfast. I can't miss a breakfast. <laughs> no, because can't. One, I think it's the most important meal of the day. And two, when you're pounding the phones like the way we do, you need some energy. You, mm -hmm. can't, you can't come into this office without a little bit of energy. So right. um, a lot of people started associating my... Uh, my uh, pattern with discipline. So they would tell me, Carlton, you're disciplined all the time. We love that. And then I started throwing in um, some tax knowledge in there, right? They got familiar with seeing some of the things that I was doing on a daily basis and they liked it. They wanted to follow me because of that. They like following people who are what they say they are. You have to be an all the time person. Right. And then now that I was showing them that I'm an all the time person, they can trust me. It's time to show them the knowledge that I have. And I didn't deliver it in a way that I'm just providing information. I showed them how important it meant to me that they knew the information. 
This is things that I'm dealing with every single day. I'll turn to the camera and be like, I just got out of a consultation with this client. Here are their tax questions. If you are someone that has similar tax questions, please call me, send me a message, and you have to be so real and sincere Mm -hmm. people can sniff out fake from a mile away yeah and it's even more common now when you're leaving videos online people can easily know when you're just advertising yourself or you're trying to provide value so my goal is to do just that provide value without advertising myself i'm simply here to serve you and when you're there to serve people is when it comes back to you tenfold right and i think i think you're definitely uh balancing that you know you're able to be genuine um, at the same time, provide entertainment and value, yeah. you know, and I think, or I know that helps the business aspect, especially like your mom's business, Carla Dennis and associates, right? just because you are showing that you're out there serving, providing value, but you're not really there to like, be like, all right, you know, buy this product right, right. now, you know, you're providing value first. And if they do choose to go with your service, then they already know you. Right. You know? Yeah. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people kind of forget. You know, they, they sell first, but people don't know them yet. Yeah. How can you develop rapport with someone who doesn't know you? You have to ease your way into that. If you come out firing out the gate saying, here, buy my product, obviously I'm the best tax person in the world. People are gonna be like, uh, who are you? No thanks. Mm-hmm. I'm not spending that type of money on someone who I don't know. Right. You have to show people who you are first and people honestly want to see who you are. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I started off just showing them the discipline and the type of person I am. Then I started showing them who I'm about in my personal life, showing them some of the things that I like to do outside of the, um, the office. Um, and then they started associating me as someone who is disciplined outside of the office too. He likes to cook. He likes to work out. He likes to spend time with his family. Family. okay this is what this guy is about mm-hmm. he's a very uh um, all the time guy and he's an honest and right righteous person and then when i started educating them about certain material that i was passionate about they don't feel the sense of i'm selling them they feel like oh this is a normal person who's doing his normal job and is also trying to provide value to people i don't mind if i ask him a question he's probably just going to respond to my question and give me the answer mm-hmm. because he is someone who provides value to people i've seen him i've seen what he do- does on instagram he's a very caring and giving person I'm sure that he'll be able to answer my question for me. And that's what I want people to feel. I want to feel approachable to people. And the best salespeople online are the ones who feel super approachable even though they're selling you at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. You give them the big picture. Correct. You know, not just the tax part, but also what you do throughout the day. Yeah. Which is very important. So I know you talked about the discipline Mm -hmm. and managing your day. So how can you give like just a couple tips, just one tip maybe on how you manage your day, your time specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I manage my time in blocks. I am the most effective when I work in blocks. Everything is blocked. Um, If you've ever looked at a calendar and you see all the lines down the page, I work exactly like that. Nothing comes outside of my blocks. This is how I execute on being a high ticket salesperson, how I execute on being able to call over 150 leads a day, and how I execute on even being able to make it into the gym every single day. I work in blocks and I hold myself accountable. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll even do an accountability check with a sibling. I have uh, three other brothers um, who I love dearly. Um, I will let them know my daily schedule right as I wake up so they can ask me about how my day went and hold me accountable for some of the items that I told them that I was gonna do that day. Um, another thing that I also do is I write my goals down twice a day. Most people write their goals down only once. I write my goals down right as I wake up. I have a pad that sits next to my bed. I only write down seven goals because I don't want to, um, waste my time writing down things, um, that are extending past my thought process, which can happen. Sometimes you just start just writing all different things and you're not centered on what is the true mission. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I write down seven goals when I wake up in the morning, then I head off to the gym, um, come back home. I'll uh, do my prayer, meditate, something that I just picked up recently over the last month and a half, which I'm loving now. Um, It's allowing me to become more effective too. I make my breakfast come into the office and from that point on, I'm working in blocks throughout the rest of the day. Right before bed, right around 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night is when I'm writing down my next set of goals Mm -hmm. um, and then knocking out for the night. And something that I also changed changed about myself when I left out of college is I started sleeping earlier more. I wake up early and I go to sleep early. And that was something that I literally did the opposite of in college. I used to go to sleep extremely late. 
I mean, I used to see the sunrise when I was going to bed all the time. I mean, I could tell you guys how much Netflix I watched. I could compete with the next the Netflix championships in college. I was on Netflix every single night. Um, and sometimes I would go to bed at like 11 o'clock in the morning. So I wanted to make sure that when I stepped over into the business field that I conducted myself how business owners conduct themselves. And they are on top of it. They're sharp as a whistle and they're punctual. In order to be like that, you got to have the energy levels to sustain all day long. If I'm going to sleep at random hours of the night and I'm not waking up and getting a good sweat and my body's metabolism is all off, I'm not going to be at the best Carlton I could possibly be at. And I want everyone to see the best Carlton because the best Carlton is, is amazing. And I feel like everyone deserves that when they come into my office. They shouldn't get a 75% Carlton, the Carlton that, you know, hits news 15 times before he rolls into the office to sell you on something. They should get the Carlton that got out of bed and got after it today. And that's the Carlton I want to provide to everyone. Right. That's very important. Very important. Now, any failure or one story of a failure that you experienced and how did you overcome it? You know... I feel like failure surrounds me every day. I'm seeking out failure now, Mike. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you guys have to get over if you're viewing this is the idea that you live in a perfect life. You do not live in a perfect life. And if you are without failure, you are doing something wrong. You need to constantly seek out opportunities and you need to constantly be failing often. Um, something that I like to talk about a lot on Instagram. Um, and the reason why is this, as soon as you fail is as soon as you learn. As soon as you fail is as soon as you learn. I can tell you about so many different consultations where I approached the conversation wrong. I asked the client about certain things that I shouldn't have asked about. I didn't ask the right questions that I should have asked. Or even some of the littlest simple mistakes when I was just starting out in my sales career, such as sending out engagement agreements, spelling clients' names wrong. That's mm -hmm. things I can never take back, but I learned to this day that I'll never make small mistakes like that ever again. And you learn, you, le you learn to fail so that you can become the person who you're meant to be. And you just got to love failing. So that way you can get to the other side, um, which is being in the know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very important. Now, how do you, I'm sure, you know, you're, you're dealing with like a lot of stress sometimes and at moments, you know, some challenges and pressure. How do you handle stress or pressure when dealing with something like a client or anything else in the office? Gratitude. Gratitude. That has been my 2019 word. Every single morning I wake up, I feel blessed to be alive. I feel so incredibly blessed to come into an office that my mom had created and having my own door with my own name on it, being able to sit behind my own desk, have a laptop and a computer that works, a cell phone that I can afford to pay the bill on and be able to create income for myself without someone needing to stand over my shoulder. Starting off with my day like that and being gracious for what I already have, it makes a lot of the small things I deal with throughout the day so minuscule to the bigger image of where I'm trying to go. Also something I do is I also make sure I always keep the end goal in mind. Um, anything you put energy on expands. That's something that I learned. When you put energy on small problems or a client complain or you not being able to get to the, your workout that day or you miss lunch and you're just frustrated because you couldn't eat and you got all these back-to-back -back appointments, anything you put energy on expands. I used to be like that. I used to put energy on the fact that I got sick of having back-to-back -back appointments. I'm like, why am I sick of having back-to-back -back appointments? There's so many salespeople out there that are on the phones every single day just trying to get one appointment. I'm over here complaining I'm in back-to-back -back appointments and I couldn't eat Chipotle for lunch? You've gotta be kidding me. I am back-to-back -back because that is what success looks like. Right. You're gonna be back-to-back -back since you killed it on the phones. Yeah. But yet I'm over here you know, complaining or even getting down on myself when I have a deal that didn't close the same day. Mm -hmm. I'm happy that I, a client even wanted to listen to me and give me the time of day to have me share what I love about taxes and how I can help benefit them. And if I live righteously and do things the right way, things will continue to come back to me in tenfold and opportunity will always be there for me. And so you have to start off with gratitude. You have to be gracious for what you already have, but know that you are always climbing and always striving. Keep the end goal in mind. Um, and, and most importantly, don't put energy on too many things because whatever you put energy on, it expands. Right, right. So true. That's very true. Um, I think nowadays, you know, people get caught up in, you know, the little things that 
you have to know when to choose your battles. You right. know, there's there's things that you need to put your focus on and things that you can just brush off. Right. You know, and um, knowing which one to focus on is is important. Yeah. So for you, um, you know, what what's your why? Why do you keep doing what you're doing mm -hmm. as a career? Yeah. So I have a lot of whys, but the most important why that I have is I want to take care of my family, man. And it used to be, and I'm so sorry to say this, you know, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. I, I had a more of a selfish mindset um, before that. I used to only want to take care of Carlton. I used to want to put Carlton in a position to where Carlton can do everything that he wants to do, right? Um, travel, afford the cars, the lifestyle I want, provide to my church, give back, do the things that Carlton wants to do. Now that I live with this gratitude, this uh, character trait that I wake up with every single day, I realize what my mom has provided to me. I realize what my dad has provided to me. I realize that my mom has ran a business for 28 years and she's still inside of the business. I want to now work to get my mom not only, you know, in a position to where she can go off and do the things that she wants to do. I want to provide her whatever I possibly can provide to her um, for the remaining time that she has on this earth because we know that, you know, nothing is for certain. You know, at any moment's notice, my mom could be taken from me. God forbid, right? At any moment's notice, you, your family members can be taken from you. I strive so that I can create the time to enjoy life with my parents and be able to give them all the things that they gave to me. If you go back and you look at your life between the ages of one day to 18, life was really not that hard. It really wasn't that hard because your parents worked so hard to make life not that hard for you. And now I'm just speaking on myself individually. Now I'm not speaking on everyone out there because everyone was raised differently and so many people were raised without their parents. And I was fortunate to have both of them. But life was not that hard. Having my parents from day one through age 18, there was very little things I had to worry about because how hard my parents worked to make my life so simple and so mm. easy. I am so gracious and thankful for what they were able to provide to me that with maturity and with time at the age of 25, I already realized how much my parents had to sacrifice for me to even live without worry for even to live without worry. Now, all I want to do is get myself to a position to where I can give my mom a small fraction of what she's been able to provide to me by being able to take her on the trips that she wants to go on or put her in the house that she's always dreamed about or, or really just spending the time with her that I don't get to spend with her that I really truly want to spend with her. But right now we're in a state of really grinding and making sure we're building the lives for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so when I told you that control was the one thing that I said I really wanted in life. It's not just for Carlton. I don't want control just so I can do whatever I want whenever I want. I want the control to be able to provide um, for my family, to be able to weather any storm. At any moment's notice, anything can happen to your parents, to your siblings, and that can shift everything. I know I had a client whose mom got diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. And if you don't mind, Mike, I'd share the story. Go ahead. My uh, client, his mom got diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. He had about six months before his mother was going to die. It was hard hearing that, um, mainly because I worked close to my mom. I wouldn't know what I would do if I were found out that news, right? But what he went into was, I got I to gotta figure it out mode. He went into, I got to figure it out mode because I want my mom for longer than just six months. So what he had to do was um, he had to... Um, slow down work at his job, pull out loans from the bank, pull out the income that they had out of the dad's company, and it just completely, it, it crushed their, their business and their lifestyle because they wanted to keep their mother on earth just a, a day, a couple of weeks, a couple of months longer. What that example showed me was that they weren't in a position to be able to do everything they possibly could to keep their mom on that earth longer because they couldn't afford to do everything they possibly could to keep their mom on that earth longer. If they were in a state of complete control and complete financial security, it wouldn't have mattered if my client had left his job for six months. If he would have had money coming in, if he would have had that financial security, he would have had no fear doing that. He would have been able to spend the time every day over those six months with his mom in the time that she had left instead of being in the mortgage lender's office or in the loan office asking for money and then going to the other mortgage lender and asking for money and going to the other mortgage lender asking for money he would have spent the most valuable time with his mom on her deathbed at that time but he didn't have the time or the control to do so 
And it's those examples that keep me driving um, the way that I'm driving because like I said, nothing is for certain. And being in this chair and dealing with so many different clients on a daily basis, I've seen it all. And I also see the ones who have gotten to that position, to the position where they have the income to be able to provide for themselves three, four year lifetimes worth of. They don't live as in much fear because they know if anything happens, they have that income because they worked so hard to get that income to be able to be able to support those family members who are in trouble, to be able to provide to um, Haiti and different countries who are going through hurricanes or going through um, different finance or disasters um, that are out of our control. And those are things that I want to be able to do. I want to leave a mark on this world. And I can leave a mark in a number of different ways, but having income definitely allows you to leave a very impactful mark on a lot of people by how you're able to provide for a lot of people. That's what I want to do. Yeah, that that's, you know, that story is definitely hard to hear yeah. for sure, but it also brings about the realities of life just because nothing is guaranteed, but it's always important. It's never too late to start preparing to right. to get prepared for the future just because you know whatever happens you want to be in the best position you can be um not just for yourself but your for your family like you said right so um yeah that's that's a very important point that you brought up for sure and you know mike i i look at it like like going into war we me you and me both played football mm -hmm. going into war for us was going into the football game being as prepared as you possibly can yeah no one wants to go into war without their shield or without their sword. But I feel like my client, when that situation happened, he had to go to war and he only had a shield and he didn't have a sword to fight with. All he could do was just try to protect, protect, protect. He couldn't, he couldn't strike back and try to fend off the cancer that was attacking his mom. I wish that my client had that sword. I wanted my client to have that sword. And I know there's a lot of different other situations where people wish they did have that sword for the battles that they're fighting. But if we don't prepare for those moments, if we don't set ourselves up for those moments, we won't be able to fight against those moments. We will only be able to hold that shield and fend ourselves off. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, that 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 analogy, I think, sums it up for yeah. sure. Um, so for you, knowing what you know now as a tax professional, what advice would you give to your younger self with the things that you know now? The advice that I would give to my younger self would <laughs> it's definitely going to be a start off being smart with your money i mean yeah. as a child you don't even know what you're saving your money for your parents tell you save your money save your money they're in your ears about it they're in your ears about it we don't even know where we got our money from when we were children we figured it out but when we got money we just blew it right away because we always had something that we were saving it for to blow right. it on mm -hmm. until you are making money steadily coming in you shouldn't be spending any money. And that's what yeah. my issue was. Um, anytime I got a little bit of money, I was spending it instead of figuring out how I can invest it to make more money so I can have the lifestyle that I wanted. If I can go back and tell my younger self, I would have at least made sure that I um, saved at least three to six months of expenses. You know what I mean? If I can go back and talk to my 21 year old self, I would have told my 21 year old self, add up all your expenses that you have, your rent, your cell phone bill, how much you eat out, what you spend your money on, clothes, all your expenses. Now go save six months of that. Add it all up for a month, go save six months of that and put it into a bank account that you can't touch, that you just can't touch. And then once you get that six months savings account, based on whatever income you have coming in, if you got a job, great. Whatever income you have coming in, try as hard as you can to save 40%. And if you can't yet, save as much as you possibly can to push over into that account on a month to month basis. 40% is the goal that you wanna to get to. Get to an income where you eventually can save 40% of every paycheck that you have coming in and funnel that over to that emergency account. Because what that emergency account's gonna turn into, it's gonna turn into two accounts. One will be for emergency and one will be for investing. And getting yourself invested is how you can get yourself into a position to always have money coming in and not having to worry as much. That's something I wish I would have told my younger self is, and there's so much things that you can tell your younger self, but it would have been more disciplined with my money. Be more disciplined with your money. And then the other thing that I wanna make sure I hit on is, is learn more about influencers. Learn more about YouTube. Learn more about how there is so much information that can help you on YouTube that is just waiting out there to grasp. There is so many different oh, yeah. influencers, business owners that have created so much golden content out there for you guys and it's sitting on YouTube just waiting for you to click play. 
go learn instead of watching Netflix and TV shows of Arrow and The Flash and Dexter and <laughs> Breaking the Bad out of the bricks. <laughs> <laughs> Get on YouTube and go learn something that's actually going to help you in life. Because guess what, guys? Netflix ain't going nowhere. And neither is all the Indiana Jones movies I had to watch. And neither is all the Transformers movies I had to watch. That information isn't going anywhere. So if you know it's not going anywhere, how about you go get you the information that's going to change your life now so that way you can re you can view all that other information later when you're comfy, nice and cozy in your retirement at 50 instead of 75. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Why not invest in yourself um, with the time that you have instead of, you know, just using it just for pure entertainment purposes. Correct. You know, Netflix is making money off of you yeah. as you're watching. Yeah. Why can't you make money for yourself? and watch something else. That's <laughs> and that's exactly you know? right. And if I would have done things all over again, I would have definitely spent more time on YouTube because I would have learned to sell stuff faster. I would have met, I would have learned about Grant Cardone faster. Mm -hmm. I would have learned about Ty Lopez faster. All these other people who have shaped me into who I am today, I would have all those skills much sooner, which would have put me in a different income state much sooner, which means I would have gotten to that ultimate goal much sooner, which is control and being able to provide for my family, friends, church, and myself. And that's eventually what I want to get to is a place where I can provide for anyone without fear. You know what I mean? Yeah. Being financially secure. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. So what's in it for your future? Yeah, in my future, I'm planning on releasing a book here pretty soon for millennials, like I've already told you. Um, I am now growing my sales team. Um, so that was something that had started back when I was 22. It is going to continue to grow until I'll eventually... Um, I'll be able to step over into different roles inside the company, such as being able to be um, more the influencer that Carla is, my mother. Right now, my mother's in a really awesome position because she established her credibility in the tax world. So now she can speak on news channels, travel cal down up and down California and give events to uh, different associations, such as the Apartment Owners Association. Um, since I love real estate and I love connecting with people who own real estate, I want to eventually start a course for real estate investors on how they can leverage the tax codes to offset their income and and grow the real estate businesses. And I also want to eventually get um, more invested in the real estate market um, because I also believe that having a lot of real estate is how you can build your wealth. A lot of the clients who I work with who have, have uh, the goals that I had or have already made it to the place where I'm seeking to get to, um, they're very diversified, but most of their investments sit with real estate. And so I do believe that is um, one of the best ways to get to where you want to go financially. Perfect. I yeah. mean... You couldn't have said it better. You know, I uh, I really appreciate all the info that you provided. Um, this is it. This is the end of the episode. Man, I didn't think yeah. it was going to be over this soon. But, but it flew by so fast. I did. You know? It did. We started getting into some really thick conversation when you started uh, penetrating to me about um, what I really wanted, what my overall goal is, what is my why. Anytime yeah. you ask someone who is a football athlete what their why <laughs> is, they're going to give you a response really quick because that's something that you got to – you got to have a strong why when you're in the football field. When you're on yeah. the football field, you're getting banged up, beat up. You're going into the weight room day in and day out. You're you're lifting muscles that are already sore. Oh, yeah. You know, what is your why? Why are you putting yourself through all of that? It's not just to say you were a football athlete and you did something that you liked. You actually have a overall goal behind it. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that is what really drives you when the going gets tough, when the rain is, you know, pouring down in your face and you're grinding it out. And, you know, you drop your book bags on your way to the office in the rain and the puddle. <sighs> Why am I here, right? Well, why am I still doing this? Uh -huh. Why do I show up to the same building and sit in the same chair every single day from eight until five o'clock? Why do I do it? Why? Mm -hmm. It's because I have a dream. My dream is to take care of my family. I know that this is the vehicle to get myself there. I know that I wanna help other people. I know that I have knowledge that other people need from me. Mm -hmm. It would be a shame if I kept the knowledge here and not provide the knowledge out there. And it would be a shame if I only just provide the knowledge to just one person who's sitting across from me because there's only so many hours in the day. Yeah. What I do is I take my knowledge to social media because social media is an outlet that allows me to share with multiple people. I can't keep all this information in. Mm -hmm. But if I live in fear, I will never be able to work to my fullest capabilities if I'm not sharing the knowledge that I feel confident that I know I have that other people need. And if you have a burning desire inside, um, to share your skill sets and your 
um, your knowledge with other people who you know genuinely need it, you have a duty and an obligation to provide that information to people. Success is your duty, and it's an obligation that you have to succeed in. So. I'm gonna stay on this path that I am on. I know you're gonna stay on the path that you're on. And one of the cool things about our relationship is that um, as entrepreneurs and people who are extremely ambitious and striving for more, we have to check ourselves sometimes, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we stay in communication with each other, that we're both still striving for the goals that we have, um, and that we're holding each other accountable. And we also stay in communication with each other because there's not too many people out there um, that are doing what we do, that are passionate, hungry, motivated, driven, and aren't just thinking about the weekend, happy hours, um, sake bombs, tequila shots, um, being on the beach every single weekend, that's no longer us. Right. We realize that that comes, you know, when you have created the lifestyle that you want because that's not going anywhere. The beach isn't going anywhere. The tequila shots aren't going anywhere. There's always going to be tequila on shelves, guys. It's not going anywhere. The <laughs> clubs aren't going anywhere. The only thing that changes is your age. And, not, and what entrepreneurs do and what the wealthy do, Jeff Bezos, they're racing against time. That's what they do. They created these companies and built them because they wanted income to be able to earn the time they wanted back. They want time. They want time to be able to travel for a month on vacation instead of just a weekend. Two months on vacation instead of just a week. Mm -hmm. They want the lifestyle that they want so they can have the time doing the things that they want. But what we like to do as millennials is like we like to reward ourselves. We really like to reward ourselves after almost everything. We had a hard day, <sighs> I need a beer. We had a rough week. I need to go out. Mm -hmm. um, we got a promotion. I have to celebrate. Let's go to Vegas. Mm. We, we have to reward ourselves. I believe in rewarding yourself, but I believe in being very strategic in how you reward yourself. Sometimes I reward myself with more work. Sometimes I do. It's like, dude, you earned that extra, you earned an extra 50 calls, man. Mm -hmm. Go after that. Go get it because you earned it. Mm -hmm. You're already killing it right now. Why are you going to let your foot up off the gas? and go party with all the other people that are doing the exact same things. How about you put your foot on the gas, which is different than what the, what the society tells you to do. How about you put your foot on the gas and you go right while everyone goes left and heads out the office. How about you put your foot on the gas a little bit more? And that's what we do. And that's mm -hmm. what, why there's so little of us. That's why there's so little of us. Because there's so little drivers who are pushing down on that pedal at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, surround yourself with like-minded individuals, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, and that's it. You'll get you'll get to where you want to go faster if you if you do it that way for yeah. sure, without a doubt. Without guys, doubt. you guys need to make sure that you follow Mike Zuniga on YouTube. Like, subscribe, comment on his videos. He is on to something. If you are a creator out there, I even advise that you reach out to him and and, and extend and ask for an interview with him. He's very open. He's he loves to communicate and he likes to help people who are passionate about what they do. Um, the reason why he reached out to me is because he knew I was a all the time person, someone who he felt would would be ideal to be on his show, who carried himself good in his only in his personal life and in the workforce. Um, you, you you can't be somebody, guys, who who likes to be successful only when it's it's convenient. Who likes to show that they're successful only when it's convenient. It's very hard to keep this hat on all the time. I understand it is. But what I advise that you do is I advise that you pray on the things that you want most in life. Because you'll realize that it'll start shifting the actions that you take on a daily basis. And your actions that you start shifting to will start becoming a part of you. And that will be become who you are. And eventually you'll be okay with it. And you'll block out all the naysayers, all the haters, all the comments, all the people who spend their time talking crap and saying things to bring you down on the internet, you'll eventually start laughing at it because you'll realize you transition into a new person who's just striving for more. There we go. Carlton right. Dennis. Thank right. you. I appreciate all the kind words, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks Mike. for being on. And I Anytime. wish you all the best. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. Thanks again for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll be placing Carlton's social media links in the show notes so you can stay connected. And if you receive great content out of this episode and know someone that can benefit from it, please share it. So thanks again for joining in. And until next time, I'll see you in the next episode. Peace.